Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we explore the impact of technology on our lives and in the business world, of course. And I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and, and today I have a special guest who is at the forefront of one of the most fascinating intersections in technology today. And that is the blending of human and digital workforces. We've all seen the headlines about the lack of automation taking over, jobs going, etc. But it's how these two converge together to be more productive that really excites me. And today's guest is Kit Cox, founder of a company called Innate. And he's going to be joining us to discuss the future of work and how this platform is solving some of the biggest challenges that companies face in this age of automation and artificial intelligence. And I want to learn more about his origin story, where back in 2017, he had an epiphany with years of experience supporting enterprise-level organizations in automation. He recognized that technology had matured to that point where it could not only replicate human action, but could actually work synergistically with human capabilities. But I've probably revealed far too many spoilers already, so I'm going to take a step back now and ask you all to buckle up and hold on tight as we beam your ears all the way to Cheltenham here in the UK, where Kit Cox is waiting to speak with us today. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Hello, I'm Kit. Uh, I'm Kit Cox. Uh, I'm the founder and CTO of a company called E8. I'm a manufacturing engineer by training and by going to university and working in that field for a while. And then uh, I always developed software from when I was, you know, when I was a little kid. So that came through from hobby and actually then became my, uh, became my job and my career uh, and landed up with me founding this lovely business. Well, one of the things that set off my tech spidey senses and put you on my radar was when I was reading about the the moment of realization, I think it was back in 2017, that led to you mm. to switch from bespoke automation projects to creating innate. So can you tell me more about that moment, the key factors that influence your decision? Because I got a feeling there's a bit of a story there, right? Yeah, yeah. So so back in 2017, uh you know, I was I was running the business and we'd we were doing an awful lot of work with service providers. So big service provider organizations tended to be providing managed services, you know, the you know, the capitas and circos and stuff of this world. Yeah. And and that was great. And we built a you know, nice product for running those kind of services. But it was also something that was uh was pretty pretty particular and yeah, you know, very, very focused automation projects, like you say. And actually what we saw, we started to hear about this robotic process automation technology sort of really bubbling in the market at that point uh it was it was one of those things that when when people first started talking about it they went oh hold on what robots in in business service centers and call centers what's what's this and actually they're not robots at all it was a bit of software uh but everyone was getting really excited about it as a way of doing automation without having to ask the IT people to do the automation for you. That's what people were getting excited about because you know, every single one of my customers at that time had a list as long as your arm of projects that IT didn't have time to get around to doing for them. So that's why they were getting excited. And 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 really there were yeah, there was this opportunity to go and create these you know, little task task automation widgets. Yeah. To go and help people in a, in a service center, in a service delivery environment, automate stuff. And when we looked at our customers at the time who were very excited about this technology, I'm sure, crikey, they, they struggle quite enough as it is managing and running and operating services with an entirely human workforce. How much worse is it going to be? How much more complicated is it going to get when that workforce is yes yeah, a whole bunch of people but it then starts being all sorts of different technologies as well yeah and then potentially when those technologies come from different vendors because you know there are some that are good at some things and there are some that are good at others 
Uh, and that surely, uh, the thought process was that's surely going to give you a management headache. You're going to need to some way of joining up what you've got these little bots doing and what you've actually still got people doing. Yeah. And we thought, well, that's, that's probably an opportunity for that. There's, there's probably something that people are going to need to manage service delivery and invite in an environment where the service is delivered by some people and some bots. Yeah. Now, and that's and that was our hunch. That was our that was our big idea that look, there there is going to be a need for that capability. Uh, the possibly not wise thing to do at the time yeah. it's was to go yeah well we better we better stop what we're doing and go and build that bit <laughs> uh because actually we you know what what we were really looking at was uh, something that we thought would be upcoming yeah that we thought would be required in the future it wasn't something the market was clamoring for but that's you know uh that's a relatively risky way to go to go build a new product and launching new capability, but yeah, you know, it it felt well justified. And actually, is it yeah? You know, as it's transpired, you know, the first people that you know, we when we had the first cuts to the product, first people that we put it in front of, he kind of mostly gave you this sort of quizzical look, going, oh, "Hold on, but the robots are going to automate everything. So why do I need this? Why are you even talking to me about people?" But actually, the the folks who really started to bite onto the idea and caught on to it, caught on onto this idea of orchestrating work between people and people and digital workers, were the people who'd been doing automation a little bit longer. Yeah, they'd been running these projects with Blue Prism. You know, great, great you know, British success story in that RPA space and with uh, with companies like UiPath, and they'd. Uh, they'd realized the limitations of and actually that they were really quite limited and that, you, that there was this increasingly strong need to manage manage what goes into and out of those bots but also manage it is amongst the human workforce yeah uh there was a need for a production line just as much as there was a need for the machines on the production line and the humans working on the production line as well it just feels like you were so ahead of your time there, you know, and then things like managing hybrid workforces were not really a thing in 2017. Uh, eventually they were going to be, but of course the pandemic would come and, and fast track all of that stuff. And innate is ultimately designed to efficiently manage a combination of human and digital workers. So uh, just to bring this to life, for anyone listening, hearing about you guys for the first time, how yeah. does the platform handle the complexities of such a hybrid workforce? And what is it that sets it apart from other solutions? Would you say? So, uh, you know, put it put it really simply as a, uh, you know, companies who are running big services are running uh, uh, are using EDA to help them run those services. Yeah. So, every service anywhere in the world kind of breaks down into three three bits. There's a bit where you've you've got a request from a customer, and you've got to figure out what it is that the customer is actually asking you to do. Then there's a bit where you've got to get everything together to do what the customer's asking you to do. And then you just got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Every service looks like that, whether you are buying insurance, whether you're providing an HR service to somebody, whether you're providing an internal financial service, every service looks like that. So it ain't works along that journey. So we go, right, how is the customer going to be contacting us? Yeah. How is whoever's asking for the service going to be coming into us? So whether that's by email, whether it's through self-service, whether it's through one of those routes, they'll come into, that will come into Enate. So the first thing to do is get the work into Enate. Yeah, so we know what work needs to be done. So get the work in. So the email might come into Enate from uh, from somebody saying, please, can you process this invoice for me? Please, can you do this dealing transaction on my insurance as part of my insurance service? That comes into Enate. And then we'll we'll go through that exercise of figuring out what the customer is actually asking us to do. Now, when we started, the best way of figuring out what a customer is asking you to do is for somebody like you or me to read the email, talk to the customer, whatever it is, and go, oh, yeah, that's what they mean. 
they've written it in their own terms. But what they actually mean is they want us to do this and this. And the joy of customers is they might ask you to do seven different things all, all in one go, or they might just give you something as one simple instruction. So that's where, that's where you've got the first need for humans, because actually it's a really subtle thing mm. when you're trying to understand what somebody's asking you to do. That's quite a subtle thing. We'll come to how, how you automate some of these things. So, and then when you get through into it, so that'll come into react, and then we'll, we'll give, we'll workflow that to a person to do. Yeah. Uh, and they'll go, ah, actually what, uh, what Neil's asking us to do is to do this dealing transaction on his insurance service. Right. There we go. Great. We know what it is now. So now we're going to route it to the next bit of the process, which is get the stuff together to do it. Now, so once we know what it is, and then it's kind of, well, okay, Neil, I'm going to need from you a copy of your passport to prove who you are. I'm going to need from you, uh, yeah, the bank account instructions that you want us to pay the money into after we've done the dealing. Maybe that's what you need. So there's a bit of to and fro then where, where you've got to go and get, get information from somebody. So again, we're, co- we're coordinating that. Those communications come out from ENA. You reply, and great. We're getting to a point where a person again, because people have worked, you know, back in 2017, 18, people are really good at going, ah, no, he's, you know, you see that, he smudged that bit of his, uh, of his passport copy, so I need to ask him for another one to, or whatever. Yeah. So those first two bits could be quite, quite people centric. But then when we get into the just do it bit, great. You've told us how much you, how much you want to deal in your insurance policy. You've, we've got the information that you approved your you and we can send you the money at the end of it. Great. Well, now we've just got to do it. Now, just doing it is very boring for most people because it involves, Going and logging into this horrible old green screen system to go and go and do the dealing transaction. It goes and it involves going and putting it on the market. It go whatever, and that's the bit that great. Well, there's a there are robots that can be coded up to do that really well, but, and they can be coded up because you're just following rules at that point. You're going great. It's Neil. He's in the UK. This is his insurance policy number. This is his life insurance policy number. Here's how much he wants to deal. Go and do it. Click, 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 click. Done. Yeah. So, and again, in eight will give that work to a robot that's free to do it. It can go and do it. If it goes wrong or breaks, then it will give that back to in eight and we'll put it in front of a real human to go, uh, you figure out what you want to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if it doesn't go wrong and it's perfectly successful, great. Then job done. And the last bit is we'll communicate back to you that said, say, our work here is done. But actually managing that from end to end. So I'll just talk to you about one process. Mm. But actually most service providers have got hundreds of processes that they, that make up their service. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can do a deal on it. You can add a, yeah, on your insurance service. You can, you can add a beneficiary. You can have one of your beneficiaries die, all sorts of things. Yeah. There are hundreds and hundreds of processes. We've all got that basic structure, but actually your workforce that you're trying to orchestrate, you've got yeah, hundreds of people and hundreds of digital workers, and you're trying to get the right work to the right worker at the right time to keep Neil happy and make sure that we deal on his insurance policy at the right time, and that's what Innate's doing. So Innate is not only managing the work from end to end and giving it to the right worker, whether it's a human or one of these bots, but it's doing that but all of the workers doing all of the work and figuring out what the best thing to do is at any moment in time. And the time you're saving for your customers there is just absolutely incredible. And predictably, as a result, you've got an investment from Angel and venture capitalists. So on behalf of any startup founder listening, I'm curious, how has that external funding impacted the development and scalability of NA? And are, are there any unique challenges that come with that level of investment too? There aren't any unique challenges come with it, actually, firstly, because yeah. unless you've gone and picked a totally wrong investor for you, uh, then you should be pretty aligned with them on your objectives. There, you know, there are great benefits that come with it. Uh, you know, ultimately, you generate, you know, we get investment into the business. Uh, that allows us to hire amazing people. You know, one of the things that I enjoy most is building, is building our team. Yeah, you know, it's the 
probably the thing I'm proudest of actually is the is the team that we've built and uh not only how exceptionally capable they are in in, in their skills, but also how nice they are, actually. <laughs> yeah. As uh, they're a they're a really wonderful and nice bunch of people to work with. Uh so that and that's you know, I mean guys it's fairly obvious when you put it like that. But those those things, people allow businesses to scale. Yeah. Uh, the right you know, the right people in the right place allow business to scale and that's that's been the the great thing from receiving that funding. But it's also, you know, uh one of my angel investors actually is uh has come comes from running uh software companies for running financial exchanges. Mm. And they've never taken any external investment in. They've grown their business profitably from the get go. And it's, it is perfectly possible to build successful businesses either way yeah but in a reasonably capital intensive one like enterprise software it doesn't half help if you can get some of that capital in the first place yeah to to help you help you drive and help you get forward there's definitely the case that you know you get a different lens arrives when you get uh purely financial investors in yeah i uh, angels are yeah are interested in the vision yeah financial investors best one in the world are interested in the cash yeah yeah uh, and it's as simple as that so uh so that and that's why actually making sure you've got somebody that you can align with reasonably well that is yeah, has the right attitude to has what shares your values on and shares your attitude to cash value, business staff, all of those kind of things is is really worthwhile. And I think I think we did a pretty good job of that with uh, with Mercia. And I was reading before you came on the podcast with high profile clients from TMF EY to CMS. I would suspect that you're quite locked down as to what use cases uh, you can share or what has been challenging or rewarding, but. Is there anything you can share around any maybe case studies that demonstrate those efficiency gains that can be achieved within eight, just for any business leader that's listening and wanting to understand how it might bring them value too? Yeah, sure. So, so I'll 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 talk you through a couple of stories. Actually. Yeah. So, uh, actually, you asked the question in a really interesting way. You, know, you ask you, you you asked it in terms of uh, rewarding. Uh, I think like that. So, but I, I'm going to answer answer on the basis of what have I found rewarding in terms of seeing the transformation and change and scope of change in in, in the in those clients. So, I talked to you about TMF first, and now I'll come talk about one of the others. So, but uh, TMF most most people haven't heard of TMF. Most <laughs> most of your audience won't have heard of TMF. And they're, a, they're an interesting company that in that their business is helping big brands globalize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh for example, if yeah, if yeah, Amazon has a presence in Uzbekistan, uh then they yeah, and they probably want somebody to provide the financial accounting services, run the HR and payroll, actually run the corporate entities, yeah, within Uzbekistani law. Yeah, well, and by the way, this is a hypothetical example. I have no idea if this is an actual customer, <laughs> but uh, but TMF provide that service. Yeah, so TMF help big companies run their businesses, the finance and accounting, the company secretarial fiduciary services, and the HR and payroll services in seventy five countries. Tends to be where those businesses have got relatively small presence. So. One of the things that lots of people who sell process and automation software talk about is, uh, well, it really helps if you standardize before you start automating. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's very admirable words, but uh, very often it, it doesn't make much sense because you take this TMF example. So they're operating in 75 countries. So they're having to deal with the company law, 
for the companies that they manage in those 75 countries. And they're having to deal with the employment law for the companies that they provide HR and payroll services to in those countries. Okay, cool. And they've got a lot of customers. They've got like 10,000 customers that they're providing these services to. Uh, so, and each of those customers can have a little bit of variability in how they want the service provided to them. Yeah, they might want different data back. They all sorts of things. So they've got 75 countries times 10,000 customers times four main service lines. Yeah, you multiply all those together. That is, yeah. that is a lot of that is a lot of possibility for variance. <laughs> In, that that gives you the mother of all standardization problems. Hmm. Now, and actually, you can't standardize in that kind of world. And actually, most of the world. You can't really standardize. You can standardize at a high level to go, so you've got some kind of way of communicating at a high level. But you can't standardize about how a payroll gets run so that the right get taxes get paid in Brazil because the taxes and when you've got to pay them and all of those kind of things are different in Brazil to they are in Belgium. Yeah. And you can't standardize that. So what we did with TMF, TMF had this fantastic vision that they wanted to have one way of managing work across the business in those 75 countries, across those four, four services. They wanted to have one way of talking to their customers about the work that they were doing for their customers. But they also wanted to be able to uh, have variability where it was necessary. They wanted to be able to deal with the fact that the Belgians and the Brazilians have different laws. And actually, that's what they've been able to achieve by deploying EA. So they've rolled out EA across 5,000 service delivery staff in 75 countries in 12 languages. But they've rolled it out in a way that they have standardized, but at really high level. So they've now got in EA one way that they can, if a, cu if a customer in any one of those 75 countries asks them, where are you with this? They have a standard way of talking to them about the work that they're doing. Yeah. So they will be able to say, we are either processing or we're finalizing your payroll in Belgium or your or your company company director change in, in France. One way that they can talk to their customers. They've got one platform that manages, yeah, so we're managing all of the service delivery demand that comes into that business, all of the emails that come in and go out. They've got a real smorgasbord of automation technologies that they've then been able to bring to bear as, as part of it. So when when we when I gave you that example earlier, we were talking about these RPA bots as one of the one of the ways you automate things. Now obviously the world has moved on since there was just RPA bots. And now there are myriad different ways that we can automate things with myriad different technologies. So, uh, I was talking about the, the fact that the first bit of delivering every service is figuring out what the customer's asking you to do. Mm. Well, a year ago, that was really hard to automate, really hard. But now we've got GPT, which actually does a really good job of automating. So actually, one of the things that they've been able to do you know, is to bring GPT in to help them do that categorization up front. So Inade's got GPT now baked in that goes, oh, actually, Neil's asking us to do this. Yeah, and therefore we can get it to the right people at the right time straight away. So we've gone from having just RPA available to automate things to now we've got large language models that help us automate lots of decisioning. We've got things like intelligent document processing in TMF, where they're using a product called Inferred, which is, again is linked in with Innate, to go, great, we've received a copy of Neil's passport. Let's go and extract all the data out of that and so that we can upload it straight into this underlying system. So that's another one of those automation technologies, intelligent document processing, they call it, that's appearing in that, in that journey. One of the other things they do is they do lots of data manipulation. Yeah, so they've got you know, an awful lot of an awful lot of service delivery actually involves getting some kind of slightly rubbishly formatted data from a customer 
and turning it into a shape that you can upload it into an underlying system. And they've got Alteryx as the system that they're using to do that. Because it's the exactly right tool designed for exactly that job. So there isn't just one digital worker in there. There are lots of different types of digital worker. The you know, sitting across those 5,000 people and all of those different digital workers, get the right work to the right one at the right time and making sure that every single customer gets served and making sure that the Belgian's doing it in a Belgian way and the Brazilian's doing it in a, Bel- in a Brazilian way but they've still got one language to talk to customers in. And we were doing incredibly well there. We got to 30 minutes on a tech podcast talking about automation without mentioning AI and chat GPT. And of course, <laughs> it's all anybody's talking about at the moment, and there's a lot of conversations in every business around AI and automation challenges. So what problems should organizations be anticipating when looking to implement AI and automation into their workforce? And, and, how do you in a, address some of these challenges? Because I would imagine these, these are things that people are asking you again and again right now, right? Yeah. And the good thing is I think we can answer. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I'm going to break this into two halves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the best way to think of this split is look at your organization, look at the people that work in your organization and go, right, what are their job titles? Do their jobs include words like right? create, build, yeah, those kind of things. And and those, there is one approach to deploying and adopting AI with those. I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, the second group is those people that, yeah, whose job titles include like words like you know, execute and deliver and serve and those kind of things. Now, for, for that group, where you're in some kind of service delivery environment, where you're in some kind of process execution environment, transaction execution. Deploying AI into that world, you need to be reasonably careful about it because actually you're going to be deploying it in a way that is managing your customer's data. Unless you're really careful about how you think about it, it's going to be making sort of primary decisions for you, not sort of co-piloted ones, but actually you're going to be going, I, I'm going to try and get this to do work for me. The way it's going to save me money is it's going to do work for me. And really what you need to do is be able to see, plug it in in that world in a way that there is always able to be some kind of human validation of what it's done. And that's what you need to do really in that world. So the way that we're plugging in GPT to do categorization, for example, of, of figuring out what somebody's asking you to do is, you know, we make it very simple and switch onable. Literally, you just switch it on, go, I want I want GPT to do that. I'll figure out what somebody's asking me to do. But then we'll let you categorize it to something. But ultimately, we're, at that point, we're putting it in front of somebody going, here's what we think it is. Now just get crack on and do it. But actually... If GPT's got it slightly wrong, just like humans get it slightly wrong, yeah. I mean, neither you nor I are infallible in making a decision based upon the contents of an email. Yeah. Well, great. We just let somebody recategorize it back to what it actually, well, what it actually should be. Yeah. So that's this kind of really simple example of of wherever you're deploying AI in that kind of service delivery world, make sure you've always got the ability to have the human in the loop and the human correcting along the way. Yeah, and that's what we're doing with Innate. So each of these places where where we're bringing different types of AI in, whether it's GPT or whether it's intelligent document processing, we're giving we're doing it in a way that is controlled, is governed, is audited, and we're managing. Ah, the AI is not very confident about it. Give it to Neil to actually think about. It. Give it to Kit to actually review. Yeah. So that's what you've got to do in that kind of world. If you're in the world of job titles where it is write, build, create, then then normally you're in a space where you could just go and start using some generative AI capability pretty much off the peg. Yeah, so, for example, I've got a large chunk of my engineering team now. Kind of their, their standard working instruction for them, for them is the first cut of your code must come from AI. Yeah, don't try and handcraft it all yourself. Yeah, because, but the reason that that's possible is 
is pretty low risk because we've then got seven layers of testing and further development that come after that. So I, I'm using, yeah, that way you're using AI as a kind of go go gadget arm, yeah, to give you a bit of a boost. But you haven't got any risk because you've got so much QA that happens afterwards. You know, if it, if you're a copywriter and you know getting getting GPT to to give you some initial bits of copy, there's so much QA that comes out and editing that comes out from you as a person after that. It's a non-issue. So my recommendation is split things into those two camps. If you're in the kind of service delivery, execute, deliver kind of camp, then you need some kind of orchestration engine like you know, like Enable or something like that to manage that end-to-end, give you governance and manage human in the loop. Yeah. And if you're in the build, go, create world, just go and use. And the only thing that's universal then is make sure you understand what data is going where, whether it's data that you care about going, going to where it's where, where you're putting it, uh, and what what uh, approaches are you going to put in place to secure it. Certainly, the number one thing that every single one of our customers has asked is, you know, when, when we're going, yeah, we're going to be using GPT for those. They go, uh, right, where's the data going? Is it being used to train the underlying model? All of those things. You need crystal clear answers for that. We've done it in a way that it doesn't. Yeah, it's, it stays entirely within our tenant. It doesn't go to train the underlying model. And actually, that tends to, customers tend to be really happy with that. But that approach to data management, businesses need to really get to grips with and pretty quickly, actually. 100% with you on that. And if we look back, just 12 months ago, there were self proclaimed futurists and technologists claiming, putting their predictions down for what technologies or what emerging technologies would dominate 2023 of course they all said things like metaverse and nfts and nobody said gen ai so i know this is <laughs> very very difficult but uh, i would ask you to look into my virtual crystal ball now and ask you are there any technologies that you foresee becoming more prevalent in organizations especially when they begin adopting more automation and robotics and how do you think these technologies fundamentally will alter work processes and service delivery, not just next year, but in the immediate future too? Everybody's kind of gone, oh, wow, okay, that's what it means. Uh, and I was in this camp as well. I, I did not expect that leap to come that big and that fast. Mm. Uh, and there are a few things about it. So, So firstly... And this is the assumption that we're building pretty much everything that we do on, is that generic models, yeah, you know, like GPT, like Bard, like you know, Llama, and all those kind of things, uh, are going to be just fine for most case use cases. So, twelve months ago, AI in most business meant having a bunch of data scientists and and you know a cabal of geeks going <laughs> going and building kind of dedicated machine learning models. And actually most of those models have been made instantly obsolete. Yeah. And we are we are in this period of instant obsolescence now. Yeah. Where yeah, there is the shiny, shiny thing that is the best at doing something in the world until the next slightly shinier thing comes along and it does it a bit better. Yeah. And there is no good reason to stick with this thing that does it does it a bit worse and switch over to the thing that's a bit better. Yeah, there's yeah, I haven't built up kind of engineering, I haven't built up debt in this old thing. Just switch to the new one. Yeah. So we that is going to be a behavior that we need to get used to and get used to seeing. So we we've already seen it actually with with TMF. We already saw it. They were they were using a product called UI path communication mining or trying to. And when GPT came along and when we showed them GPT working in Titan 8, they went, oh yeah, now that's just better and quicker. And and actually, UI path communication mining has gone to instantly obsolete. At some point soon, GPT or GPT 3.5 will go to instantly obsolete. Uh, at which point, well, you've got to be in a place that you can switch. Yeah. Because and that's that's going to be the iteration. So, uh, 
the ability to use these tools for more and more reasoning is going to be massive. The approach to giving them giving them data and feeding company specific data in to that decision making process is also going to be massive. So I've got one not prediction, but it's a it's another hunch. Yeah. Yeah. So an awful lot of what we do in business has been built up because people like rules. Mm. People like rules and they because rules mean really good things for society and for customers like fairness and stuff like that. fairness comes from rules. Yeah. Uh has lots of good connotations. And people write those rules down and, and things like policies and stuff like that. And then they've got all the data that's kind of sw- sloshing around in their business. They've got you know, they've got data about the transactions they're doing. They've got data about their customers, all of these kind of things. And then we've created this, this whole construct called business processes. Mm. We created this entire construct because we like rules because they mean things like fairness and doing you know, g- and good quality, and we've got data, and that data's got constraints in it. Like, like I can't, uh, I can't pay for something until I've got a purchase order signed that I'm buying it. Those kind of things. Yeah. And then with this whole idea of business processes, we've gone well. We've got business processes as a kind of intermediate layer because people are not all that good. Uh, Totally understanding the rules that are in this that, that are in this policy, and they're not un- good at understanding the constraints in the data. So we've had to build the business processes to be the intermediate layer between the two. But I think that might slowly start to ebb away as we get to a point where actually we have machines now, we have general models and general models that if you give them a bit of company specific data give you a much richer response where you can go, I actually know I'm going to look at policy from a point of view of plain English. Yeah. And I'm going to look at data from a point of view of understanding its constraints. And I'm going to go, well, we're not going to have to write the rules down in a process to say, how do I match these two up? We can just go and figure it out in real time. Mm. Yeah. So I think that might be a trend actually is, is that we see what people try to do in process, ebbing away and being something that just happens with policies and with data. Love that. I especially love the line you use there, a cabal of geeks. I might have to use that in one of my future <laughs> tech articles for sure. I'm going to borrow that one from you. And, uh, but you also mentioned uh, policy there and yeah. governance, etc. And one of the features of Innate is that you offer complete visibility and better governance. And in the age of remote work and digital transformation, how important are these factors and, and how does your platform platform ultimately ensure them too? So by well, lots of indust- lots of industries is table stakes. Yeah. Because an awful lot of industries are regulated. Mm. Yeah. And even some industries that aren't currently regulated, we can expect to be more regulated in the near future. <laughs> yeah. Uh so Having that ability to prove what you've done through a through a customer journey, that's the essence of governance. The essence of governance is going, being able to prove what you've done and prove what you that what you've done is in line with the policies that you've that you've defined. Yeah. Now right now we do that through you know process definition way because most customers still think of things in terms of process process definition but increasingly we're going to get to a point where you can get at least that narrative version of proof of yeah why did you do this without needing to actually go well because we went through this step in the process yeah you can do it by proving that the data was was done was transacted correctly in line with uh in line with the policy so right now Innate gives you that total traceability of this is how 
workflow, this is how a service delivered was delivered, this is what we received from the customer, this is why the decisions were made, this is what went back to the customer. Mm. But our trajectories over the next uh, over the next few you know, months and years is to be able to do more and more of that without having to define it in a process first. And just building on that, there's a lot of talk at the moment about the future of work. People are trying to understand what the future of work will look like in 2024 and beyond. So I'm curious, where do, bear in mind of what you've just said there, where do you see the future of work heading, particularly in relation to automation and human-machine collaboration? And, and what role do you see innate playing on that landscape too? So... I mean, it's a, it's a really difficult question to yeah. to answer in a way because, it, and it's more of a question of pace than than anything. So there is going to be radical change to jobs yeah. over the next few months, years. Yeah, actually, no, we don't need to go to decades. Mm. It's going to be single digit years. There are going to be radical changes to jobs. What can be you know, what can be automated is is growing at really exponential pace. I think what's really shocked people with Gen AI is we thought that all the creative stuff, all of that was probably safe from automation for a while, and everybody's gone. Oh no, crap! That's the low hanging fruit. That's the easy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's been a real shock. So, uh, it's not an entirely rosy picture of the future of work. Yeah. There are some parts of the future of work that are, that are where people are going to have to be reskilling, retraining, changing their focus quite significantly in ways that they will find uncomfortable. To an extent, we're all going to be doing that. Yeah. Uh, but there is some positive to it, which is you know, bearing in mind that we are in the middle of a of a massive squeeze on credit with inflation running high, etc. We still have extraordinarily resilient unemployment numbers. We still have pretty much more jobs than there are people to do. And that's a universal problem as well. Yeah. In a lot of developed economies as well. There are more jobs than there are people to do to, 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 to do those jobs, and therefore we need we need the productivity that AI is going to give us. We massively need that pro- productivity, but I'm not sure everybody in white collar professions was expecting actually that the really stable things will become caring roles and things like that, yeah. which will be which will be very human centric. So. Things that are very human centric and that are very centered on human to human interaction, those are the future of work for humans. Yeah. I, I went to Fastenbury earlier this year. Oh, you and me both. I, I've been like the last 20 years. So, yeah. Oh, awesome. Great, great tweet. And actually, you walk around Glastonbury and go, there is not a single job here that's going to be automated with AI. Not one. Yeah. Not one. Uh, apart from perhaps some of the creation of the music, ironically, yeah. But otherwise, literally the entire the entire experience is a is so concentrated on human to human interaction, and that sense that is uh, that's as good an example as, as any of the future of work, yeah. As things that are a very human to human based. I think that's a powerful moment to end on. But we've been on an incredible journey today, starting from your origin story to where we're heading, what the future looks like. But before I let you go, none of us are able to achieve any degree of success without a little help along the way. So I'm now going to ask you to just look back throughout your career. Is there a particular person that you're grateful towards? Maybe they saw something in you, invested a bit of time. How did you get you where you are? Who would that person be and why? (laughs) Okay. So... uh, (laughs) Uh, it's going to be my wife. It ought to be. It ought to be somebody like that. It's going to be. It's going to be my wife. So, I think when you set out to start a business, particularly if you're foolish enough to set out to start a reasonably capital-intensive business, 
Well, you need to have built something quite big before you can sell it. Uh, you need to expect it's okay to be fairly poor for a while while you're setting it up, unless you're doing it in like you're in your late forties and fifties, in which case you know fine. Yeah, but I but I didn't. Uh, so and sure enough, when yeah when I when I set when I set up the business, I was yeah I was fairly stony broke. I was really stony broke, and and uh, my one of the many things that went on then was I yeah, bathroom window got a bit rotted, and then. And then on a really stormy day in the UK, it uh, it blew out. And, that fell out. and then and I couldn't afford a new bathroom window because I was really stony broke. Because <laughs> we just found it a business and uh, I didn't have any money. And uh, so my engagement present from my wife was uh, was a new bathroom window. <laughs> so who says romance is dead? You know? Yeah, e- exactly. <laughs> but but so so yes, uh, I would go. Find the kind of person who thinks it's all right to get you a new battery window as an engagement present. Oh, I love it. And for anyone listening just wants to find out more information about Innate, maybe continue this conversation we've started today. Where would you point everyone listening? So come to our website, you know, innate.io, E-N-A-T-E.io. Come and have a look there. Look me up on LinkedIn. I'm the only Kit Cox there, K-I-T-C-O-X. Uh, and yeah. Please feel free to ping me in there, and I'm loving to hear stories and engage with people on how they're deploying AI and automating in their business. Well, we covered so much there from the problems organizations need to consider when they look at implementing AI and automation. We know that just about everyone's doing that at the moment. What technologies organizations may start to use over the coming years, and also uh, a fact that I didn't mention in there that I should have, that businesses using it innate to do a lot of this stuff can become 20% more efficient. And I know at a time where every tech project is under close scrutiny for what ROI does it offer, what value does it offer, that is a huge figure. So thank you so much for sharing that and your story. And hopefully, assuming we both get through ticket day, maybe we can have a pint at Bimbleyn or the Brothers Bar next year <laughs> at Glastonbury. But thanks for joining me today. Defo. Nice one. Good to see you. So a huge thank you to Kit Cox for sharing his journey, his insights, how we can uh, more efficiently manage a future where bots and humans don't replace each other, don't compete with each other, but complement each other and coexist in the workforce. And I think the world of work is undergoing a seismic shift and platforms like Innate are actually guiding us through these uncharted territories with both opportunities and challenges that it might bring. And we did touch on a, quite a few crucial points from the underlying architecture of services in a company to the transformative power of automation and AI and some of those ethical considerations that the, that business leaders are grappling with. So Kit has been added to the cool guys I'm going to share a beer with or, or a warm cider at next year's Glastonbury Festival. It is my favourite place because I do record a podcast every single day of the year and this is the one time of the year where i don't have any emails i don't have any podcasts just me wandering around with a warm cider listening to bands so uh, if you are going if you get tickets and i do watch this space maybe we can all meet for a drink and a sing along as always email me techblogwriter at outlook.com connect with me on twitter linkedin instagram i'm just at neil c hughes easiest guy in the world to find But thanks for listening. I'll be back again tomorrow with another interview. And we'll continue demystifying complex technologies and discussing their real-world applications that generate business value. But I've taken up far too much of your time. So thanks for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. (laughs) 